We had an absolutely wonderful session again. And thanks to many of you who stepped up to come and help the governor and I push good common sense policies, which we typically don't see out of government, good common sense policies that is moving our state in the right direction. Before we ended up last year, before the end of December, we had over 141,000 private sector jobs that were created in this state. Private sector jobs. So that ratio equated to, for every one government job, 12 private sector jobs were created. That's a move in the right direction. Last, like, not this one, but the one before, previous legislative session, we reduced burdensome regulations, we reduced taxes for homeowners and small businesses. We came back this year and capitalized on that as well. Increased the corporate tax cuts so that our small businesses don't have that burden looked at additional regulations that were impediments to business growth and development, continued the path of making Florida business friendly so that the companies the governor and I are speaking to and asking them to either come to Florida or looking at how they can expand in Florida to create those long sustainable jobs, those things are going to be moving forward with our jobs plan. Additionally, we looked at special taxing districts. The session before last, we mandated somewhat to the water management districts because what we saw is over taxation to property owners. And they had such surpluses in their coffers. So the governor and I asked why? If you're collecting more taxes than you need to operate and do the regulatory things that you're supposed to do, why do you have the surplus? A surplus, whether it's a federal level or not, means they're collecting too much taxes. So therefore, we encourage them strongly to reduce that burden on homeowners, which hopefully in your, who, who was the tax collector here? What's that? He's the assessor, the yes, collector is not here tonight. That's true, there you go. So hopefully in the assessment, <laughs> the property values, the property amount have, to, have had a reduction in their taxes for those reductions. But additionally, we found there's so many multi-layer special taxing districts that the, um, the burden on homeowners still exists. And they come throughout the years being unaccounted for the dollars that they're collecting, and each one of them have billions of dollars, well, collectively, have billions of dollars, I think in the excess of $6 billion of excess revenue just sitting there. Again, that means homeowners, small businesses are being overtaxed. And that's what we're about. Reducing the taxation, reducing the burdens to businesses and homeowners, making Florida the best place to live, work, and play. Once we do that, we create a climate that everyone from across, across the globe or in other states would want to come here. But it cannot just be for Disney World. It cannot just be for our beaches. It cannot just be for our recreation. It has to be a place where they know that the business climate is something that's certain, the taxes and regulations is something that's certain, because once they open their doors, they have to factor in all the costs, whether it's variable or fixed costs, that's going to be incorporated into that business operation, and how then can they turn a profit, and the P word is not a bad word, ladies and gentlemen, because they turn a profit, they're able to provide better pay for their employees, better compensation for their employees, they're able to expand their businesses, and maybe even have spinoffs. And let's talk about spinoffs. Today I had a wonderful opportunity to be over at Cecil Field, which Cecil Field is now designated a spaceport. I chair Space Florida, and one of my responsibilities is to increase operation across the board with our space operations in Florida. Not only launches, I ask many people around this country, is space dead, or space exploration dead for this country, because of the shuttle program ending, they will tell me yes. They said, we no longer have NASA. We sure do. We no longer have launches. We sure do. We launch satellites. We launch other applications. As a matter of fact, on the 30th of April, <laughs> SpaceX, which is a commercial company, and this is going to be the direction as, as to how we reduce costs for our space operations, is commercializing space public-private partnership, getting the equipment to be developed sooner, getting to get um, 
for the operation to be cheaper and also make sure that we can turn things around and have new technologies to spin off from this. So when we launch on the 30th, this is going to be the first payload that we're sending to the International Space Station since the show. And if we're successful, which I am really praying because we've already had two launches from SpaceX that were successful, this is the first that will be docking to the International Space Station to take a payload. If this is successful, now SpaceX will be able to develop and, and, and coordinated with, with other commercial activities, a manned reusable capsule, which that's what the space shuttle was. At least that's a, a spacecraft that was, be, was able to be reused for manned um, voyage to the International Space Station. We would not be reliant on the Russians then to take our astronauts to the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need. The Russians last two space capsule uh, vehicles blew up and that was just last year late last year I don't want to chance our astronauts going up on any one of their spacecrafts I'd rather be on ours because we're very prudent and we don't take lies for granted these are risk high-risk jobs however with space with the spaceport being designated as Cecil this means a huge a huge advantage for Northeast Florida. It opens up a new economic market here that no other area in the state besides the Cape can claim. That means commercial tourism in space. That means new applications for development, unmanned aerial system, unmanned aerial vehicles, and additional commercial applications that can be found and new spin-off technologies right here in our backyard. And once that outer beltway is built and continues across this way, it then opens up an additional artery to bring in high-tech jobs into our area. Here, here. That's huge. <laughs> so when I talk about the things that we're doing in this state, it's a multitude of things that is looking towards the future. It comes to with either K through 12 education system, putting, putting STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math into the core curriculum. It is in our university and state colleges to put STEM as a foundation and a basis in their curriculum program. No longer can we offer in these higher eds to have basket weaving as the primary degree program coming up because we don't need that anymore. What we need to do is to be looking forward. What's a pipeline? Once a student comes four years or five years from now, what's a pipeline for the job placement? That's what we need to be looking at. And as we talk to companies that are coming in, they're looking for 21st century thinking, capabilities, analytical thinking, processing, so that we have to show through our pipeline of education, we have a skilled workforce that's coming out that you'll be able to rely upon Coming now, we have our military, we have our retirees, we have our, our students. We put out from Embraer-Riddle, University of South Florida, University of uh, Central Florida, and University of I mean, FSU, over 2,000 engineers a year. That's huge for the state, but we've had a brain drain because they get educated and they go to another state. They go to another state to work. So with these high-tech jobs, and they're coming in with $65,000, $80,000 off the bat. As a matter of fact, tomorrow morning, I go over to Gainesville for an IT company that we stole from another state, but I won't tell you who, that's coming here with 300 jobs. And their starting pay is $80,000. That's huge. Connecting, too, with the workforce coming out of the University of Florida. So all those things couple and marry up together to let individuals see that this is a great state to do business. All of the components go together. Quality of life, ability to get a trained workforce, safety and security, and having a government that's not going to be overtaxing, overburdensome regulations to preclude any business growth and development. Governor Scott and I are going to continue on this quest and this path to make sure that we leave Florida in a better state than when we were elected. We saw unemployment numbers drop by December 2011, 2.1 percentage points. We took office at 12 percentage points and ended at 9.6. Actually, we ended at 9.9, .9, then the following month it went up to 9, and then went down to 9.6.
That's huge. We still have a long ways to go. We're not going to rest until we get lower numbers. But the way we do that is bringing the jobs in, making sure we train our workforce. We have seen from our workforce boards where they were buying capes and thousands of dollars to make people feel good about being out of work. We have changed that and say your mentality is going to be, instead of unemployment, to be re-employment. We're going to train people, re-educate them, retool them for the jobs that exist today and program them so they can process for capturing jobs of tomorrow. That's the direction that this Republican leadership is taking the state. Have no fear that we are doing the things that we're supposed to do with principal leadership, with conservative values, and we're unabashedly unashamed of those conservative principles that we will continue marching forward in this direction because it is better than the alternative. Thank you very much. Jennifer, did you want to answer? Could she answer any questions? Did you? Could you take a few questions? Do you mind? Okay, I don't know. I'm sure Ken has a question. I, <laughs> LG, uh, first of all, being an Alabama graduate, I am someone who was very thankful that we had basket weaving at the University of Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> that explains it. <laughs> um, I'm also a member of the Northeast Regional Florida uh, Planning, Planning Council. Council. And I know that you remember at one time, we are all supportive of the DCA being greatly reduced in size and influence. Because they did an awful job with Northeast Florida, but the but the councils right now are facing a um, an elimination of their budgeting from the state. Now, we have a great regional cooperation from the regional planning council area. Can you have any influence with the gov to help save that money? Let me tell you something. Last year, when I saw that, because that was the first time that we, we reduced, we consolidated DCA into the Department of Economic Opportunity and <coughs> moved it down to the regional planning councils to be, because they have a better sight as to, and vision as to what's happening in the region for growth plans and development, and the state still helped facilitate in moving that <coughs> forward. So when I saw that on the chopping block, I immediately called Brian Teeple. Brian was out of town towards the end and we were like the last day or something to this decision. I'm the only one that yelling and screaming, we have to save this, but I was alone, right? If I'm going to be putting my back up and say, we need to save this, y'all better be behind me. We're there. Okay? We're there. And that's exactly what I told them this time. I said, you guys need to then speak up to say why you need the funds, what it's going to be used for, what, was, what will be the rate of return for these dollars, what's the value for the state. And if, you can't, if you're not speaking up or you can't speak out, there's nothing much I can do. We're coming out Okay, it's true. Okay. As a co-leader of Lake Area Tea Party, I want to thank you and the government for what you've done. We helped you all we could and we appreciate what you're doing. Thank you very a much. Lot. Appreciate that. year was a little different um, than last legislative session. We had so many protests in the hallway. We had protests this year too. But, uh, at least people stepped up because we weren't out there alone fighting the good fight to benefit the entire state. And so we had the chamber, we had uh, community organizations, we had just general folks stepping up to the plate to say, you know, this is the right thing to do. Cutting out tax is the right thing to do. Reducing the bureaucracy is the right thing to do. Government being responsible is the right thing to do. Making Florida business friendly and, and consumer friendly and, and safe is the right thing to do. And you guys stepped up and I truly appreciate it. You talk about emails, uh, the young man who uh, was, you, you're the one who was invited to come via email. You got blessed by our emails. But you know, in social media, they talk about emails is the way to go to reach people. You, you may get them and delete them all the time, but that is that is a new way of reaching people. So the more you can email out and get the message out, that'll be helpful. But I do want to put in an extra plug. Because as we go into this presidential election, it's very, very important for us to look at some of the things in the past that has worked. That is pressing the flesh, walking door to door, building the grassroots. Yes, we have social media now, and it's great for the youngsters, some of the things I don't even know. 
I love my staff handle that for Facebook and all that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> but I do know email. I can respond to an email. But there are ways to reach different demographic, different age groups, etc. Okay, use those things. But don't forget the old-fashioned campaigning that have made us win time and time again. And we also have to coalesce and come together. Because we've seen that time and time again have divided us and then we've lost. This election is too critical for us to either sit home or to fold our arms and get angry and say you're not going to get engaged and involved. We have our country at stake. We have our military that need a strong supporter and ruler and commander in chief. We need a country that's going to have a strong leader and supporter that will not continue to apologize for it and will defend its people and this land every inch of the way. I wasn't born in this country. I adopted this country. And I know the good things that this country was founded on, the foundation and the fabric of it. And I joined the military and served 20 years of my life defending this country. And we should not just take it for granted because we are a, a strong nation that we should just rest on our laurels and assume that everyone would respect us. We have to first respect ourselves and want to guard and protect and defend our people and this land first and foremost before we do anything else. We also have an economic situation in this country. This state is doing well. We're on our way up. You have two other states that's along with us that's doing well, but there are many bleeding in many, many states that do not have the leadership that we have in this state. And they don't have the leadership from Washington, even at the congressional level. So therefore, we need to stand up and support the strongest candidate that will bring the economics back, not apologize for this country, see this country with the value of its people, and its history and its foundation and bring it back to its righteous place. And we all need to coalesce together and make sure we have victory in 2012. Woo!